Assalamualaikum and good evening everyone. Thank you for finding your time and attending this CME uh, organized by CME Matuit Mai, uh, professional. Our topic today is addressing Teki Arrhythmia. And today we are so lucky that we have our Dr. Lau Mignon uh, to share this CME with us. So before we begin, I would like to remind, if you have any question, you can write in the Q&A box and we will address your question toward the end of our session. And good news is you will get one CPD point from our uh, CME today and we will provide the CPD point and also e-certificate at the end of our session. So without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker, Dr. Lau Minyong, a clinical specialist in cardiology, National Health Institute, Malaysia. He graduated from Malacca Manipal Medical College in 2014 and passed his MRCP in 2018. He is a certified electrophysiology, electrophysiology specialist. So please welcome Dr. Lau Minyong. Thank you, Arifah, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you all see my slide? Yes, can. Okay. Uh, any black cloud? Uh? Uh, the black one actually the the between the ah uh, yeah now no more. Okay. 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 So uh, thank you Iskandar for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about arrhythmia. So take care arrhythmia um is actually something that is very close to me la. And Iskandar since Iskandar is in my team now, <laughs> uh, not my team sorry, Doctor Surinder's team, but we are in the same team. So um. Without further ado, I'll just um, go into the topic proper. Uh, I thought I'd change the, the, the topic a bit for emergency setting because I think most of us are not equipped to deal with um, arrhythmia per se. That means you cannot ablate the arrhythmia if there is. Normally, we refer to the tertiary center. So for us, it's um, immediate treatment, diagnosis. That's the most important. So I cannot uh, emphasize this enough, but every tachycardia with house has to follow this algorithm. Uh, I would like to mention this algorithm again, um, but I'm sure a lot of you know this algorithm by heart, so I'm not going to go into detail. This is my algorithm if I find a patient with tachyarrhythmia. Okay, so tachyarrhythmia, very simple, stable or unstable. Okay, if it's unstable, there's only one thing that you can do, which is shock. And you shock the patient, if it's, uh, if it's an atrial rhythm, you shock with uh, 50 or 100. Normally, I would start me, with just 100. Uh, me, I, sorry, me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a black box la, on the right lower side. Right lower, la, but there's no oh, yeah. box on there. Just above the, the, the IGN, uh, uh, this one. Oh. Uh, now still there? Yeah, still there. Oh. Try to make it full screen. I, I, I'm reading at full screen. Wait, I just pause and see. Oh, okay. If, if that's my picture. Case, uh, no, 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 that's my picture. <laughs> okay, uh, share screen. Wait, uh, let's go. You don't can see, is it? Yeah. Because I can't, I can't see my own screen. Wait on. Mm, can I go in and come back? I think so. Sure, sure, can.
Hello? Ah, okay. Okay. Are you sharing screen or are you sharing the PowerPoint? No, I'll uh, share the PowerPoint. I think the screen has some problem. Yeah. Okay, you see any? Okay. Okay, now better. Okay. Better, better. So, yeah, as I said, uh, unstable or stable? If it's unstable, there's no question. You have to cardio with the patient. And then the jewel depends on whether it's regular or wide, la, the complex. If it's stable, then the, the, prob the good thing about stable is you always have time. So time is on your side. So if you have time, you can analyze the rhythm. And how do you analyze? There's two, two ways to analyze. One is non-pharmacological and non what's pharmacological. Of course, non-pharmacological non use uh, is you analyze the ECG with a lot of uh, aldems. Uh. But if it's pharmacological, normally in Malaysia, there's only two drugs that you use. One is adenosine, almost amiodarone. Um, I won't go through this, but this is the second part of the ACLS algorithm. I think most of us know. We do not have tokenamide. Um, as the ACLS recommends, and, we, and so we cannot use uh, procainamide for normally procainamide is for AT. But we can use amidoron, adenosine, sotalol. I don't think we have even in IGN, we don't have IV sotalol, we have TAP sotalol. So these two cannot be used in Malaysia. Okay. So very simple. Uh, this is okay. So when you read about tachycardia, it's always very simple, but in real life, it's never as simple as. As you love. Um, of course, you have two. Uh, when you have to carry fence, either supraventricular or ventricular. Whatever is above the, uh, the AV node is definitely supraventricular. Below the AV node, you either have the his bundle branch and, and uh, Purkinje. They can be considered uh, ventricular. So, this is classical. If you look at the books, the read textbook, very simple. This one, anyone can tell you supraventricular tachycardia. This one, anyone can tell you is ventricular tachycardia. The problem lies um, in the ease of diagnosis. Is it really that easy in life? I'm sure those that are in emergency department will know that. This actually in, in real life is not so easy. It's not so clear cut. You can see T wave so easily or VT, the, the QRS is so broad. And let me tell you that there are so many algorithms in, later I'll show you there's so many algorithms in the, in the, in the world that try and, tries and differentiate SVT and VT. But until there is no algorithm that's 100%, even for us, when we diagnose, we may be wrong. That's how difficult it is. So a very short um, touch on the mechanism of tachyarrhythmias. So there's a mnemonic for this, it's ART, A -R -T, so automaticity, at normal automaticity, re-entry or triggered activity. So basically it's the art of tachyarrhythmia that we are going to discuss, okay? Uh, automaticity, I won't touch a lot, and trigger activity. Basically, automaticity means um, an abnormal firing um, and it's focal. So that means it's firing from one spot, but because it's the, the, uh, the action potential, um, basically it's phase four. If the phase four of action potential is shorter, then your um, cells fire faster and it'll be abnormal. So if you have things like atrial tachycardia, uh, inappropriate tachycardia, all due to abnormal automaticity. VT can also be automatic, and you will know this when your VT does not respond to anything. Whatever you do, the VT is just persistently there. If you shock the patient, whether you overdrive facing the patient, is there. That is automatic, and it's due to drives, sympathetic drives that are very high. Okay, so triggered activity basically is something that triggers a PVC. So there are two, um, what we call early and early after depolarization and 
delayed after depolarization. Why after depolarization? Because these PVCs normally or, or this trigger triggering always happens after depolarization. Um, if it happens in phase two, phase three of depolarization, then it's called auto depolarization. If it's after in phase four, means after phase three, then it's delayed. Okay. I won't go into the details of this. Um, basically, this is the reason why you get a lot of PVCs or in digoxin toxicity, you get a lot of PVCs, bigem, non-sustained BTs. Um, just remember that after depolarizations normally is physiological or pathological, but if you get a delay after depolarization, it's always pathological. So things that you need to see is like a potassium, then you have to look at the uh, digoxin levels if the patient is, is on digoxin and also ischemia. These are the triggers of the, of the depolarizations. This is the most important. 95, 90 to 95% of your tachycardias will always be re-entry. So um, re-entry basically needs two pathways, okay? Slow and one fast. I use AVNRT as an example because that's the easiest to actually, um, easiest to depict this theory of re-entry. So you have, let's say you have AV and RT, means you have two pathways, one slow and one fast. But in normal people, you only have one pathway, which you call, we call it fast. Lah. But um, there actually is not much that you can do to, if you only have one pathway, there's not much slow and fast uh, involved because you only have one, there's nothing to compare. Whereas if you have two ways, and one you label as fast, one you label as slow. The slow is not actually slow, but it's slow in relation to the fast that you have. It's like this. If you have one pathway, then you've got nothing to compare, right? I always use running as, a, as an example. Lah. So if you, if you realize this, this is standard. So if you can see, he has no one to compare with. So a P7.28 or for 10 km for him, he can say it's fast. But no one will catch the thing because there's no one to come, nothing to come. But now you see, I I use, I'm sure all of us know who is this. This is in book. He's fast. So I use him to represent fast pathway. And this is uh Kipchoge. I'm sure a lot, all of us know him also. I use him to represent slow pathway. But I'm sure that Iskandar can never beat Kipchoge even if Kipchoge is slow. So Kipchoge is slow in relative to Usain Bolt. Okay. So you have two pathways, fast and slow. The property of a fast pathway is all fast pathways normally depolarize very fast, but it takes longer to relax, like, like both, exactly. So on a 200 meter, it takes longer for him to recover compared to Kipchoge because he's very trained to run long distances. His recovery is very fast, but he cannot run fast as fast as Okay, so fast pathway, um, fast depolarization, long refractory period, slow pathway, uh, see polarization, but short refractory period, very fast it recovers. So this is what happens in AVNRT. This is normal conduction. In normal setting, what happens is an impulse comes down, meets slow and fast pathway, conducts down both, okay? Because they are both not in refractory period. So it conducts down both, but of course it conducts down faster in the fast way because it depolarizes faster. So these slow pathways actually meet this, uh, this uh, tissue, that is already depolarized by the fast pathway. So the tissue is in refractory period and it ends there, okay? This is normal conduction. The problem happens when there's an earlier conduction, means PAC, PVC, whatever, la, junctional, topic. So, but normally it's PAC. La. So when a PAC comes in, now it's early, okay? When it's early, it comes, and then it meets these two pathways again. But the fast, remember I told you, it has long refractory period. So when it has long refractory period, it cannot allow this impulse to go down. So it blocks in the fast pathway, but it can travel in the slow because the slow recovers very fast. So it travels in the slow and depolarizes down. But when, by the time it, because it's slow, right? So by the time it reaches the end, it can now depolarize up the fast pathway already. Then this will go uh, round and round and round and you form AV and RT. Okay, this is most common, but this can anywhere. It can even happen in your ventricle. If you have a scar tissue and normal tissue, scar tissue will be slow, normal tissue will be fast. Same thing happens. Atrial, same. You have atrial fibrosis, cause load conduction, and you have normal atrium. Same thing, it cause re-entry. Okay, but this is the basis of re-entry. Okay, so supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, of course, supraventricular tachycardia is an umbrella term. Uh, no, last time when I was in 
KKM, I used to say uh, SVT can be diagnosed by emergency uh, department. But once you come to the ward, it cannot diagnose SVT anymore because SVT is an umbrella term. You have to do something to determine what is it. So for some people, they assume sinus, they take sinus tachycardia as SVT. So for all intents and purposes, that's not the, the contention today. We would just label sinus tachycardia as SVT or not SVT. It doesn't matter. Okay. Then this is the uh, crux of SVT that you have. You have AVNRT, which I just described. You have ADRT, which I'll describe later. You have atrial tachycardia, which most of your uh, SVTs will fall into atrial tachycardia. For atrial tachycardia, you have macro reentrant, micro reentrant. I'm sure all of us are, are familiar with flutter. Flutter is a macro reentrant atrial tachycardia. Okay, but it's still an atrial tachycardia. Um, then you have junctional tachycardia, and you have atrial fibrillation. Okay, the atrial fibrillation. I'm sure a lot. I'm sure most of us know what's atrial fibrillation, so I won't describe it. Lah. Junctional tachycardia is just like AVNRT, but it's a foci. So AVNRT is a circuit. Junctional tachycardia is a foci. Okay, so stable tachyarrhythmias. Um, these are the, the list of stable tachyarrhythmias. Huh? If unstable, remember, just shock, don't ask, don't think, um, don't use algorithms, nothing. So you, know, you have stable tachyarrhythmias, you have VT, and the VT can be polymorphic, monomorphic, and you have all the five tachycardias I said just now. Okay, so first part of this talk, the talk of VT, because VT is the most dangerous. Lah. So you have polymorphic, monomorphic VT. So this monomorphic, uh, I think most of us can see because the complexes are actually regular. Okay, And this is a polymorphic VT. You can see that the complexes are changing. Uh, some of us might call this Tosa, Tosa, Tosa de Poix. Um, but I mean, it sounds very cool, lah, but it actually it's just a polymorphic VT. And if you want, if you really want to diagnose someone with Tosa de Poix, the um, criteria to actually diagnose it is long QT. You must have long QT. If you don't have long QT, you cannot say it's tosa, even though it, it is in that undulating pattern that you get. You just call it polymorphic VT. For all intents and purposes, it's polymorphic VT. And this is the one that everyone uh, is confused about. Lah. So it's either monomorphic VT or SVT with apparency. Okay. So in order to know what is SVT with apparency, you need to know what is aberrant conduction. So aberrant conduction is basically a bundle branch block. It can be left or right. Normally it's right, but it can also be left that occurs at very high rates. Okay. Uh, it's a fusion between his Purkinje and direct ventricular activation. So first I'll tell you what is his Purkinje and direct ventricular activation first. Okay. A his Purkinje means normal conduction. You go through the his Purkinje system very fast. So you can see in this diagram, contraction is very fast, very synchronous because there's specialized conduction tissue called the his Purkinje tissue that actually brings all this conduction. So it's very fast. And then you have direct ventricular activation. So this his Purkinje activation causes narrow QRS complex. We like this. Okay? All of us like this because it's fast and predictable. That means the cardiac output you know is good because the, the Purkinje fibers actually spread from bottom to top. Okay, So when you depolarize from bottom to top, the ventricular contraction is very good because it's from bottom to top, so you squeeze all the blood out. Okay. Compared to this, this is direct ventricular activation. I will just give you one as an example. It's a PVC. Okay, PVC when it when it fires, there is no specialized conduction to carry. Okay, so when there's no specialized conduction to carry, what it does is it depolarizes cell to cell. That means one ventricle myocardium to the next, to the next, and to the next. So it spreads out. Okay. That is why PVC, the complex is very big because there is no net cancelling force. In a normal sinus rhythm, you have cancelling forces. That means one to the left, one to the right. So you get smaller complexes. But PVC, no. That's why PVC is very big. But does big actually equal to strong? No. PVC is actually unpredictable because it depends on where's the PVC. If the PVC is from down and it goes up, then it's okay because you still maintain cardiac output, but it'll be a bit slower than if you have sinus conduction. But if your PVC is from top to bottom, then your cardiac output will be very poor. Okay. So when we see there's one, it's fine, no problem, because the next conduction is normal. But PVC, when you have multiple, that's when you get VT. That's why sometimes VT you see, okay, the patient has good VT. I'm sure a lot of us have seen 
fast VT, 100, or of course, 190, definitely is unstable, but 160, but VT is still okay. Why? Because of the cardiac output that it maintains. And some VTs are very unstable. Why? Probably because the foci of VT is from top. So the contraction is very unpredictable. Okay, so that is um, red ventricular. So you must remember, if the conduction goes through ventricular myocardium, it's direct activation. Conduction goes through his Purkinje, is uh, his Purkinje activation. Lah. Okay. So SVT rate apparency, what is it? That means the whatever rhythm it is, it can be atrial tachycardia with apparency, um, mm, flutter with apparency, AF with apparency, whatever it is comes from top. Okay. So you have a P wave or your fibrillatory waves or whatever, but you have a, something that's coming from the top. When you have normal um, rate, nothing happens because the right and left bundle have time to completely repoise before the next conduction comes. But when it's very fast, that's, that's when problem happens because the left and right bundle cannot repolarize fully. So if both don't, don't repolarize fully, it's fine. Nothing happens because then the, you, just, you just drop a beat. Okay? It doesn't conduct to left, doesn't conduct to right, you drop a beat. Nah? The P wave is there, but no QRS. The problem happens when partial. That means when you go down, you have a right bundle branch block, but your left conducts. So your left will conduct niche through the his Purkinje system. And because the right now is not conducted, it will have ventricular activation from the left to the right. Okay. So this blue line, dotted line, is the ventricular activation. So you can see the complex that you form. I go back one. Uh, the complex that you form, the first complex is sharp because it's due to his activation. The distal complex is broad because it's due to ventricular activation. So it's a fusion between these two uh, activations. Okay, so SVT with aberrancy versus VT. This is the most, um, people are most confused about. Lah. And you can see, uh, this is a lot of things that you can see, the many things, right? Uh, features favoring VT, standard patterns, blah, 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 blah. But they call it cheat sheet. So cheat sheet is something that you use uh, to make your life easier. But obviously, this one doesn't make your life easier. Uh. So you can see actually how complex this is. And then this is the very famous Bugadra criteria. Most of us use it. Um, you have four steps and also it's very confusing for me. Uh. Okay. So I'm, I'll try to actually explain to you this criteria. Actually, all these criteria use a very simple logic behind it. Uh, a lot of things in East which is logic if you know the, the, the reason behind it. So for this is very simple. You have four steps. All four steps is the reason why, why they need it like this. Okay. So if you have concordance, if you have positive or negative concordance, if your concordance is all negative, so concordance means V1 to 6. If your V1 to V6 is all negative, means your, your ECG is, the foci is coming from posterior. Okay. That means, you can never go through the his normal his Purkinje system because the his Purkinje system will divide into left and right, whatever it is, whether it's delayed or not, left and right. And you cannot have all negative because all negative means it's only from behind, only from behind coming in front. Uh, uh, all positive, sorry. If it's all negative, it's the same. That means only from in front going behind. It's very unlikely. Okay, that's number one. Uh, the other one, if you can see, is uh, I'll go number two, I'll go in a bit later, but number three first, AV dissociation, fusion and capture bits. Okay, this is very important. For me, this is the most important for VT. If I were to see a VT with confidence, this is the first thing I'll look for. Okay, whether there's fusion bit, capture bit, AV dissociation. If there is, very, very likely that it's going to be VT. Okay. So how do you explain AV dissociation capture and fusion heat? So you have a VT that is running, or uh, whatever rate it is, 180, whatever. Okay. Um, so if the VT doesn't go to the go back, that means retrograde, if it doesn't retrograde into the AV node and depolarize the atrium as well, the atrium actually beat on its own because why would it stop beating? Right? VT is running below, atrial is beating. Um, but of course the atrial is slower than the VT. Lah. So what you will see is, at some point of time, you will see P waves. Because interspersed with the ventricular activity, there will be P waves. This is hallmark of VT for me. Lah. Okay? Then next is, uh, 
what we call capture and fusion bit. So if this BT is running in a circuit, you can see that uh, at one point, because the, the, the sinus bit is beating, there will be one point that it can go down and capture the ventricular myocardium. Okay, because the VT is not, of course, I depict it like this, but it's not actually at the hispercutaneous system, somewhere far away. So if that is circulated, there is a chance that this sinus bit comes down and depolarizes the um, myocardium. And you remember when the sinus comes down, it's hispercutaneous activation, so it's very fast. So it depends on the degree of fusion between the VT and the normal um, his Purkinje activation. If the VT has no time to actually depolarize any myocardium, then you get capture B. Okay, but the VT is still running. Okay, but if there is the VT has already started capturing some myocardium, then it will come and fuse the his Purkinje that is fast come and fuse with the VT, and then you get a fusion B. Okay, there is no way that you can tell uh, whether the tachycardia is fusion beat or not, unless you have sinus freedom. If you don't have sinus freedom, oh sorry, there's no way to know whether the tachycardia has captured beat or not, unless you have sinus freedom, because you have to compare. Fusion is very easy, because as long as the QRS is a bit different, you call it fusion. But whether capture or not, because capture beat means a sinus rhythm went through. So if you want sinus rhythm to go through, you must know how the sinus rhythm looks like. So you need to have baseline ECG. Okay, that is for AV dissociation, um, capture and fusion. Okay, so now let's see. I just put both together. This is what I explained just now, SVT aberrancy. This is PVC, but if you continue, then it becomes VT. Lah. Okay, what is the difference between these two? The initial, initial. Uh, remember when I was talking about the initial depolarization, if you have SVT aberrancy, the initial depolarization is always by his protein. The later part is by ventricular. But if you have VT, the initial um, depolarization is always ventricular myocardium. So the initial sharp complex that you signifies that this is from the hispertinia system. Okay, so whatever algorithm you use after this, let's say number two, if any RS complex V1 to V6, RS is more than 100. Why more than 100? Because it's using ventricular myocardium. It's slow, so it's more than 100. Use the rabbit ear, so taller left ear. So if taller left ear means, because it's like PVC, PVC is bigger than normal sinus. So taller left ear means PT. If you have a, in, let's see the third one, A, initial R wave more than 30. Why more than 30? Because myocardial activation. And Bugada sign, the R to S is more than 100. Why more than 100? Because Again, ventricular myocardium is slow. So all algorithms henceforth actually use this basic principle. Okay, so is there an easier way uh, after I've gone through so many? So in 2022, last year, actually this group came up with the basal algorithm. Uh, this is very useful if you... But of course, there's flaws to this, to this algorithm. Um, this algorithm says that if the patient has a structural heart disease and the LV2 time to foot is more than 40, AVR also more than 40. If you have two or more criteria, it's VT. If you have zero to one, it's SVT. So you can see the ECG doesn't actually fulfill a VT diagnosis. They need clinical history. So this, the weakness of this algorithm is you need to have history for the patient. Okay, so if a structural heart disease, then it points more towards VT if you have a uh, tachyarrhythmia. But you can be wrong. Okay, you can be wrong. This is a very quick, um, very quick algorithm you can use to filter off whether it's VT or not. Okay, let's do a few exercises. Uh, one is a let's say I give this ECG. So we use like the algorithm set. Let's say we don't have history, no history at all, to an AVR. So it basically means the time to R wave, the time to R wave or the time to wave, whatever. Lah. If it's more than one box, then it's VT. Again, why more than one box? Because if you assume it's VT, it should be slow one, right? If you assume there is SVT, it should be sharp, so it's very fast, so one box. So if you can see this one clear, it's VT, because to an AVR, more than one box. Uh, by eyeballing, I think it's about 
two boxes like this. I, I, uh, I don't know. So um, VT. And did the patient eventually have VT? Yes, the patient has VT. So let's go to the second one. This is a, again, you can see two and AVR. You can see that there's a sharp, sharp um, deflection up. So that sharp deflection is very fast. So it's less than one box, okay? So if you use the criteria, yes, SVT. Does the patient have SVT with aberrancy? Yes, the patient has SVT aberrancy eventually. Okay. Now let's go to the third ECG. Look at this. Looks like SVT aberrancy, right? Because it's very sharp. So let's use the algorithm. Uh, this is the AVR. This is the very sharp, right? So yes, this patient, if you use basal, will be SVT. But look at what I just said. What's that? So that is actually looks like sinus, right? So it's either a fusion or capture beam. Can SVT aberrancy have fusion capture? No. So actually, this patient does not have SVT. This patient has a VT. Okay, so basal algorithm can be wrong, but it's a very good screening tool. So duplex tachycardia, uh, stable, unstable. Unstable, always no questions asked, cardioversion. If your patient is stable, then you can analyze with them. You can use a lot of things. You can use whatever I taught you if you have a lot of time. Um, you can use the basal algorithm. You can use pharmacological therapy like uh, adenosine, like uh, verapamil to actually try and break something. So in EP, the most important is to break the circuit. Once you break the circuit, even if it's four bits, four bits five bits, it's enough for us to um, somehow figure out what is going on with the patient. But if all else fails, the patient is in tachycardia for too long, then of course, it's cardioversion as well. Lah. Okay, so we have gone through the VTs. Now we go through the five tachyarrhythmias that are remaining. So AVNRT, AVRT, junction tachy, AT, AF. Okay, so you will be very happy if you get a uh, tachy like this. You can definitely say that this is SVT. Um, don't need to differentiate anything, but it's still an SVT. So what we should do is we should try and decipher what SVT this is. Okay, so how do we decipher? We use something called adenosine. Of course, I'm not going to tell you why when you don't use adenosine and all. I'm sure all of us know, but adenosine is the most important drug if you want to differentiate these two. Of course, you can use verapamil and etc. and the rest. But you understand the verapamil takes time. Adenosine is something that was very short acting, and the uh, effects of it is also very little. Okay, so what adenosine basically does is it hyperpolarizes the AV node. Okay, so basically when you hyperpolarize and you block the AV node, but it's very transient. So it actually blocks the AV node and makes lets you differentiate whether where first um either terminates or, or, or helps you differentiate, which I will go through it later. Lah. Okay, so I've divided it into five because we have five SVTs. Um the blue dot is AV node. The upper portion, of course, is um, atrium. The lower portion is ventricle. So we go to the right most. Um, yeah, but because I set it like that. There's no reason, there's no particular reason why it's on the right. But let's say the right, the right obviously is AF. Okay. So in A, what happens is the atrium is fibrillating. So the signal that reaches the AB node is very irregular. I mean, some is very short, some is very long. Uh, it's not the signal that is long, that means the, the time that they travel. So because atrial fibrillation is fibrillating from everywhere, right? So maybe one signal is coming from the CS force, one signal is coming from the high atrium, one signal is coming from the from the uh, left atrial appendage. And when it reaches the, the AV node, um, it, it reaches the AV node at a different time, okay? And that is why the, the QRS complex that results from atrial fibrillation is always irregular. So this is AF. Uh, AF, only AF among all the one I showed you does not show that ECG. That means a regular narrow complex tachycardia. Because AF, everyone of us know, is irregular. Okay, so now let's go to the second one. This is a rare regular firing of the AV node. Regular firing of the AV node. And so the QRS complex that it forms is also the regular. So this one is AT. That means there's a foci that regularly fires at the AV node. Okay, and then there is two that uses the AV node to fire. Okay, one of the examples I've showed you already is AV and RT. Um, remember the re-entry is now? So if you go through the slow pathway, 
you depolarize down to the ventricle, you go out the fast pathway, you depolarize one to the atrium, and it's and it continues in a circle. So you keep on depolarizing the ventricle and the atrium together. Same with junctional tachy, the concept is the same. If you have a focal activation of the AV node or the junction, you will have atrium and ventricle simultaneous activation. Okay. And the last one is called AVRT, atrial ventricular reentrant tachycardia. Basically, there is a pathway, but not Wolf Parkinson White. Wolf Parkinson White is manifest pathway. Okay. Sometimes you have concealed pathway. So as long as you have a pathway and the pathway um, participates in the tachycardia, you will get um, um, a reentrant circuit. Okay. Whether it's broad or narrow depends on the direction of the of the impulse. Okay, so basically you have antidromic and autodromic. This will be through the AV node in normal direction. That means from atrium to ventricle, going back up the SS3 pathway, and then back to the atrium and AV node. Okay, so atrium, AV node, ventricle, autodromic. Okay, if you have opposite, that means you go through the Ventricle, AV node, atrium, accessory pathway, ventricle, then only AV node, opposite, then is antidromic. So antidromic will always be broad because you're activating the ventricle from the accessory pathway. Okay. That means you're going to form a, a direct ventricular activation. So it'll be broad. Orthodromic will always be narrow because you are going through the AV, the his Purkinje fiber, going up back into the accessory pathway. So it's always narrow. Okay. Okay. So now all these five cases, you give adenosine. What happens when you give adenosine is you block the AV node. So the AV node is off the equation. So you, this red line actually blocks. It means that it blocks the AV node. Lah. So for the first three, pause. Because the AV node is the the structure that in, is involved in the tachycardia. If there is no re-entrant in the AV node, there's no tachycardia. So when you remove the AV node, if you have AV and RT, AV, RT, or JT, you will terminate the tachycardia. Will the tachycardia recur? Maybe. It may recur. If the milieu is right, it will recur. But at least for that short time, you know that you're dealing with either AV and RT, AV, RT, or JT. Okay? Whereas for AT and AF, does it mean that adenosine is useless? Obviously not. So in AT and AF, you will see is the underlying P wave. So if the, if the patient is in AF, then you get a very irregular P wave with no QRS, which makes it easier for you to see what is actually going on. If it's a flutter, which is an AT, or it's an AT, that means uh, you get discrete P waves, you can also see it because there's now no QRS complex coming into to, to affect the ECG reading. Okay, so as a summary, um, adenosine um, is therapeutic if you have AVNRT, AVRT, junctional therapy, but it's diagnostic if you have atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. Of course, it can be diagnostic for, for AVNRT, AVRT, and junctional therapy as well, because you now know that it's either one of these three. Uh, but the thing is, it's therapeutic. So you, you know that it will revert. But if it's atrial fibrillation, atrial therapy, you already diagnosed it please do not keep on giving adenosine because it'll never work. Okay? Then you have to try things like a longer acting beta blo uh, longer acting AV nodal blocker, like beta blockers, Glovera palmil, etc. Okay, so then the question is, uh, this is a very famous question. Can AV nodal blockers be used in both Parkinson White? So then the answer, uh, I'll go to straight. This is the last um, portion in the tachyarrhythmia. We're going to special tachyarrhythmias. Okay? There are a few that I like to mention. The first one is this. It's called pre-excited AF. Pre-excited AF basically means there is an AF on the background of Wolf Parkinson White. Wolf Parkinson White is manifest. Okay, it means you have delta. Okay, so um, you can use. So you have limited choices. Huh? You have ibutilite, you have procainamide, which you don't have in Malaysia. You have imid amiodarone, and you have cardioversion. Cardioversion definitely works. Amiodarone, the thing is. You have to be so in EP, you need to know when to use the drug and you need to foresee what may happen when you use the drug. Okay. If you give amiodarone, be prepared. 
to have a defeat machine near you. Okay? Because the reason why we use ibutilite and procainamide is procainamide and ibutilite is very selective to ventricular and his uh, tissue. And the accessory pathway is actually a remnant of your of your conduction system. It's normally ventricular tissue. Okay. So ibutilite and procainamide are specifically good at ventricular tissue. But amiodarone being so powerful has actually all four antiarrhythmic properties. You don't know which antiarrhythmic property is going to work. If it selectively inhibits the AV node, then you're in deep trouble. But if it selectively inhibits the, the ventricular cardium, then it's good. Then you'll terminate the tachycardia. So 50-50. So, and that is why do not simply ask people to give amiodarone if you get a case of pre-excited AF. Yeah. You need to tell them what to look forward, look what to expect. Okay? And do not give adenosine. Reason is, uh, I'll tell you later. Okay, so this is a diagram I, I did. Um, this is AVRT. Okay, now please see the difference. Uh, this is very important. Um, why one AVRT you can give adenosine and pre-excited AF you cannot? Because both is actually accessory pathway. So this is um, AVRT. You can see it's a loop. If you remove the AV node from the loop, then you terminate the tachycardia. And AVRT is characterized by Regular narrow complex tachycardia. Whatever, whatever I showed just now, pre-excited AF is AF that is bombarding the atrium, uh, the AV node and the accessory pathway. Okay, that means both of them are conducting down, but the patient is not dead because the AV node is conducting down. Okay, the AF AF rate uh, normally is four hundred and fifty to six hundred. Okay, if you block the AV node, the accessory pathway has a very short refractory period means it can conduct very fast it may not conduct 150 but it will conduct at 300 if it conducts at 300 your ventricle cannot take rates at 300 ventricle is going to is going to go into vf and the patient will go into ac store okay so this is very dangerous and please see the difference between the two ecg one is regular narrow complex tachycardia one more is broad irregular uh broad qrs complexes and the qrs complexes normally changes in degree of pre-excitation because if you have more coming from the AV node, less coming from the accessory pathway for that one beat, then you get a narrower complex. If you get more on the uh, accessory pathway and less on the AV node, then your QRS complex will be broader. So that's why the QRS complex is one thing. Okay. Then we go on to the, I think there's three more ECGs. Um, this is a special kind of VT. This is um, testicular VT. Testicular VT is in, okay, so idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia or testicular VT, you can diagnose if the patient is young. Okay, if the patient is young, let's say 35 years old, come with this ECG in your emergency department. And you can see, so now the question is SVT aberrancy or VT. And you can see in lead one, two, three, at the end of it, that is, I, I don't know whether it's a fusion or capture, but it's, it's, it's something that broke through. Okay, so you know this is VT. VT, right bundle branch block, narrowest complex. There's only one diagnosis, which is vesicular VT. So vesicular VT normally is benign, structurally normal heart. That means you assume that the patient has normal EF, you give verapamil. Okay, if your patient has MI before, comes in with this ECG, please do not just give verapamil like that and diagnose vesicular VT. Vesicular VT must be idiopathic, must be benign. If you have an ischemic vesicular VT, it's not idiopathic, it's not vesicular VT anymore. Okay, you cannot give verapamil because in patients with MI, if you give verapamil, the cardiac output will reduce. Okay, then this is something fairly seen, but if you see it, your diagnosis is very clear. If you can see this patient is going in VT, but the VT axis keeps on changing. That means it's like a bigemini. It's like a PVC with bigemini, but it's very fast. Okay. So this is called bidirectional VT because the VT has two directions. Very rarely seen nowadays. But if you get bidirectional VT, please think of ischemia, digoxin, very important, CPVT, and halimia. There is no treatment for this. You have to treat the underlying cause. There's no immediate treatment for it. Treat the underlying cause. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's the last one. So this, you can see, is what we all diagnose as TOSA. This is TOSA deployed. Okay. 
this only can happen um, if you have long QT. If you get this ECG, of course, don't go and look at the, the rhythm first. Uh, this polymorphic VT. Polymorphic VT is always unstable. Treat the patient first, get the patient out of polymorphic VT, then look back at the ECG, look for prolongation of QT. Normally, it's always there. If you have a baseline ECG that is normal, it doesn't mean that baseline means three, four years ago. It's normal, it doesn't mean the patient doesn't have long QT. Yeah? You can either have acquired long QT because maybe it took some traditional medication, or you can have congenital concealed long QT. That means the long QT only appears after some event. Let's say you are TI. Let's say it's taken antibiotics. Then only the QT happens. So if even if you have baseline, doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have long QT. You still have to do a ECG after the TOSA is treated and then see whether the patient has long QT or not. Okay, uh, I think that's the end. I welcome any questions and with that, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ming. Such a great presentation. I think it's, everyone is clear with the presentation. Uh, so, actually, I have uh, three questions. Three questions. I think more towards uh, what we call is uh, it's a practical approach to those uh, in medical department or in uh, health clinic. If uh, if they receive a patient with SBT and then is terminated after giving an lucin, does they need to refer to us? I mean the cardiology. If uh, terminated, then they admit to the ward. So what does actually, they, can they actually monitor the patient, discharge the patient and monitor in the clinic? Or actually, we they need to refer to cardiology for further assessment. I cannot hear you, bro. Oh, sorry. Uh, now you can hear, right? Yeah. yeah. But right, you have to refer because you don't know what is it. And some SVTs are curative. Like the patient's AVNRT is curative. Okay. Um, if the patient has a flutter, it's curative. If the patient's atrial fibrillation, you of course it won't work with adenosine. Lah. If the patient has atrial tachycardia, it's curative. A lot of them are curative. And uh, if you don't refer, there's of course the option of uh, medical therapy. You can give beta blockers, you can give any calcium channel blockers to block the AV node and then um, treat this as well. But you mean slow the heart rate so much that the patient doesn't have symptoms and eventually it comes in with tachycardia and discardomyopathy. And sometimes tachycardia and discardomyopathy when it's very late, it's quite difficult to treat the patient back. So if the patient is very young, then yes, please recur. If the patient is very old, like bedridden and all, then it's fine. Like you can just medical therapy. Okay. So remember, guys, huh? just like Dr. Bing say, it's curative, especially for those who are young. Please refer, even though the first episode, we can do a, a electrophysical study for them so that we just to confirm the diagnosis and to uh, cure the patient. Eh? Okay, next question, Dr. Ming, uh, regarding the PVC. Eh? This is most common. You can see uh, in a setting on health clinic or in an emergency setting or in a medical clinic, we see a lot of PVC. When to refer and when we can monitor, Dr. Ming? Hmm. So normally, PVC. Um... I, I know a lot of people use um, beta blocker of course concord um to control PVC. So PVC sometimes uh, you need to see whether some respond to beta blocker because some you lower the heart rate and the PVC disappears. Some no, especially bready induced PVC. So some you start beta blocker it becomes worse. Um, but a general rule is if it's less than ten percent, you can just monitor. Um, and if it's more than ten percent with symptoms, then you refer for bridge. If there's no symptoms then above 20 percent because you are scared that um, if the pvc is more than 20 percent you put the patient at risk of pvc in this cardiomyopathy having said that um whatever you do to monitor is one day monitor the patient may have pvc of five percent today and tomorrow 20 percent day after tomorrow 35 percent after that five percent there's a possibility because it depends pvc relies a lot on the pathetic and parasympathetic drive of the patient Okay, so 10% with symptoms or 20% without symptoms. Huh? Just refer to cardio. Huh? Actually, we, we really accept all your referral. Don't worry. Okay, because uh, at the end, you can lead to cardio, uh, tachycardia induced cardiopathy. So, uh, we have a question in the chat box. Huh? So, from Tan Cho, uh, how yeah, about uh, in pregnant lady? <laughs> pregnant yeah. lady, 35 with AVNRT, uh, ANC, no event, what we can offer the patient? 
if the heart rate is stable between 110 to 120, it's a bit tachycardic. Okay. So, it's very, actually, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, if your patient is pregnant and you have AV and RT, so the first question is, are you very sure it's AV and RT? But for all intents and purposes, we assume that it's AV and RT. So, AV and RT, so all SVTs are not, you won't die from SVT, but you'll die from BT. So, if the patient is uh, pregnant, no ANC, no event, the heart rate is about 110 or 120. I personally do not think that the 110, 120 is ABNRT lah, because ABT, the, as you remember, the re-entrant circuit is very fast. It cannot be 110 to 120. Normally, it's much faster than that. It's this sinus tachycardia that the patient has in pregnancy, which where the rate will go above 100. But assuming that it's ABNRT and it's fast, what you do is you can start some beta blocker, block the node as well, block the node first. If the patient is symptomatic or the patient develops heart failure, then you have to ablate. Now we can actually do either minimal um, con uh, fluoro ablation or nil. So if it's 35 weeks, it's either I wait until the patient is um, delivered, then I ablate the AVNRT, or you can actually refer if the patient is symptomatic. We can still ablate because it's 35 weeks, very little uh, fluoroscopy. Most of them is 3D mapping, very little fluoroscopy, but it's still doable. If it's before, uh, two twenty weeks, then it's a bit difficult because you have to use zero fluoro. Zero fluoro is possible, but it takes a very long time. Okay, okay. Now we go to the Q and A punya questions. Uh, the first one from Muhammad Fidaus. How about MAT? Uh, how to differentiate between AT and MAT? MAT is multifocal atrial tachycardia. The differentiation is very easy. Um, AT has one foci, one shape. MAT has three shapes. If you have to PAC. Yeah, it's mostly, mostly it's the P wave, the shape of the P wave, yeah. uh, different shape. Uh. Okay, yeah. this one, uh, question oh, by Dr. Rafi. Another Abdullah. one. Huh? Uh, yeah. MAT irregular. Okay, yeah, so but in, in, in irregular. So in, in yeah. DP, there's only three rhythms that's irregular. One is AF, the other one is a MAT, one is sinus and rhythm. Yeah, only three. So you can actually see. Uh. Okay, next one is from Dr. Rafi Abdullah. Huh? Uh, very good question. It's kind of SVT with a very few available hospital beds. If SVT is limited in young patient, I usually observe a few hours and discharge the patient. Of course, with a referral to cardiology after that. Is this okay? And if not, why the need for inpatient observation? Sorry, sorry. Whether, whether uh, I didn't get the huh? I didn't get the first one. I know actually regarding the SPT, uh, the one that okay. I asked uh, regarding, so I informed that actually we need to refer, they need to refer lah, to us for further assessment. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Refida is asking whether can it be done as outpatient or it of must course. be inpatient? Hmm? Of course, no need. Because hmm. SVT normally is, it is your very sure as SVT. Hmm. Normally it's not life threatening. You can always refer as outpatient. Unless the patient is very symptomatic, the patient wants something to be done, then you can admit the patient, try medical therapy, and then see whether the symptoms resolve or not, then you can discharge. In, anyway, even when you send to us, rarely we do an urgent SVT ablation. It's always an elective EPS RFA. Yeah. Okay, next question from Siti Amalina. Hi, doctor. May I know if we could have recorded? Eh, no, no. Yeah, no, actually, for the recording, we will actually share in our YouTube channel eh, for this uh, recording later on. Eh? Okay. 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 Next one. <laughs> Next one from Ching Guan Yu. If there, if there are multiple PBC occurred during general anesthesia, what is the immediate management? If it is uh, resolved post op, do we need to refer for further management? Yeah. Uh, to me, general anesthesia when you give and multiple okay, so multiple PBCs rarely happen uh, in a normal structurally normal heart. Normally, there is some cause for it. Um. Because if you're structurally normal, why would you have so many exit? So basically, if you have a lot of PVC, means you have a lot of foci. Why would you have so many foci? So actually, the, um, the core, if you have multiple PVC during your in, induction of a general anesthesia, means it's like a stress test to your patient. You already have PV, multiple PVCs on stress test. And if multiple PVCs from stress test, what you first rule out is ischemia. So yes. Um, you can do the op, no problem. But after the op, you can refer for geogram or an ischemic study or anything. Okay. Okay. Next one. Uh, the last question. Uh, uh, is aspirin indicated for patient with PVC? Aspirin. Yeah. Oh uh, no. 
short answer lah. I do not know why would you use aspirin for patient indicated PVC unless you think that the PVC is due to uh, chronic artery disease like your diabetes mellitus, which no. Um, normally, if you have PVC, very rarely do you have um, an ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease. Because you must remember, if you have coronary artery disease, then the reason why you have PVC is because um, ischemia is driving the production of PVC. So normally, instead of one PVC, you have more than one PVC, maybe a couplet, non-sustained BT, etc. I, I wouldn't start like this unless there's a I can't think of any cause actually to start as being for a patient with PVC. Okay, last question from me, eh, Ming. Um, uh, regarding you say that there's TOSA because of the long QT can lead to TOSA. Mm. Some people actually quite difficult to diagnose TOSA, uh, long QT. But if suddenly it was diagnosed and then they notice there's a TOSA there, what is the immediate treatment that they need to know? Especially for those in KK or in uh, emergency department. So that uh, the treatment uh, won't actually harm the patient. Question, first one is stable or unstable? If it's stable, you can uh -huh. give magnesium sulfate. That is to stabilize the membrane so that the TOSAT doesn't happen. TOSAT always happens because of PVC. There is no such thing as suddenly the patient instantaneously going to TOSAT. So you use magnesium sulfate to try and suppress the PVCs if the patient is stable. So normally TOSAT, what happens is you get TOSAT, but it's very short run short run of TOSAT. So if you are in a hospital setting and you worry of TOSAT, you can actually put in a temporary pacemaker, overdrive pacing. The best would be atrial pacing like if you have dual chamber pacing, but normally we don't have even IGM with single chamber. So you put in and then you pace faster. That's it. For an immediate, immediate recovery. If you're talking about a quiet long QT, if you're talking about congenital long QT, then the management is different. Then please refer. Okay. So uh, next one is uh, if patient with underlying WPW came with ischemic chest pain, do we treat as SES? Of course, because uh, WPW is a is a problem with the conduction system. ACS is the conduction uh, is a problem with the um, vessels. It's two completely different system symptoms. There is no uh, indication for urgent ablation of Parkinson. Why you can treat the coronary artery disease? then do the ablator. So actually, Wolf Parkinson White doesn't kill someone. The one that kills someone is the AF that happens on top of Wolf Parkinson White. Wolf Parkinson White alone, if you can see that the patient doesn't go into AF, actually quite harmless. That is why the sudden cardiac death with Wolf Parkinson White is 1%, 1% every year. Okay? So as you grow older, you know that the risk of atrial fibrillation is higher. So the risk of sudden cardiac death will, you know, it will increase or whatever it is. Okay, now last question eh? uh, from Alia Cooper. What can be done by KK while waiting for cardiology appointment for PVC apart from beta blocker? Mm, I'm okay. only beta blocker. Or if you have like flickernet, you can try flickernet, but please flickernet can only be used in structurally normal heart. You at least need an echo before you give the flickernet. Mm. Oh yeah, you can donate blood after radio frequency ablation. Okay. Oh yeah, you read already. Okay, the question. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. Dr. Ming is a very nice talk. Actually, the answer, uh, the question being uh, asked very uh, comprehensively. Okay, uh, Adila, back to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Iskanda. And also thank you, Dr. Ming, for the excellent talk. Uh, I know it's quite a complicated topic, but we definitely learned a lot from you today. So the link for the e-certificate and also CPD point, we already put in a chat box and the link will be available until 10.30 p.m. So now we have come to the end of our CME session. So we sincerely appreciate your participation today. Thank you for spending your evening with us and hope you learn one or two from our session today. Uh, so hope to see you again in the next CME by Matt Twitmine. Thank you, everyone.